Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the living God. As we continue our Easter celebration today, we are encouraged that despite our doubts and despite our fears and despite the opposition that we face, the message of Easter marches on. Because the message of Easter is not a myth, it is not a hoax, it is not a conspiracy, it is reality. A reality of an empty tomb. A reality of a living Jesus. And a reality of over 500 people who saw this living Savior once at the same time. And so because the message of Easter marches on, so do we who gather around that message. The church of Jesus Christ. And we march on confident that the one who died for us is now the one who lives for us and who reigns over all things for us. And it's in this confidence that today, our eighth grader from Christ Lutheran School will also publicly confess his unity in the faith with us and his dedication to Christ and his gospel at his confirmation. Our worship begins with the hymn, In Christ Alone, it's hymn 752. It's found on pages 16 and 17 of your service folder. God bless your worship. stand.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Dear friends, let us confess that often we have lived for ourselves, confident in the forgiveness of him who lived, died, and rose for us. I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. After his resurrection, Christ commanded his church to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to all nations, promising that their words were as certain as his. Therefore, it is by Christ's command and with his authority that I say to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The nations can and do rage against the Lord and against His Anointed One and against those who proclaim Him. They have done this ever since He came. But because of him, because of the life that we have in him, and because of the fact that that life can't be taken away from us, we, as the apostles did, continue to confess him, and his kingdom continues on. We read from Acts chapter 5, our first reading from God's word. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, 
were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. We join together in singing our psalm of praise, Psalm 150.
Our second reading is from the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy, which was the last letter that Paul wrote before being put to death for his testimony and profession about Christ, but an encouragement to Timothy to follow in his footsteps and stay faithful by staying in the Word. It also serves as the basis for the sermon today. We read. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please stand. Alleluia, Alleluia. Just as so many in our current culture do, after the death of Jesus, Thomas overestimated his eyes and underestimated the eyewitness testimony of the other apostles. May God grant his spirit to us that we would avoid Thomas in his failures and join him in his post-inspection of Jesus' confession, my Lord and my God. The Gospel is from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you 
may have life in his name. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing the hymn of the day, Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands. We sing verses one through four. Christ is risen. risen Alleluia. It happened 24 years ago, about this time of year. I was confirmed on May 18th, 1997. I thought that I knew a lot, but I didn't because I was only 15. I memorized a lot of verses about forgiveness, but I had no idea how hard forgiveness is until I started holding grudges like an adult. I knew that God wanted me to be selfless, but I had no idea how selfish I was 
until I started to take care of other people. At 15, I didn't know a thing about suffering or waiting on God. I'm an old man now, and I cannot even imagine what I did not know 24 years ago. The word confirmation means strengthening. But I wasn't very strong at 15. To be honest, I'm not sure how strong I am today. How about you? And that's why today, God confirms us. He wants to make us strong. Whether you're a 14-year-old in a confirmation gown or you're someone who took that gown off decades ago. God wants to make us strong because we have no clue what's coming tomorrow. Are we ready for the accident? The birth? The death? The promotion? The despair? Are we ready for the moments that we didn't ask for or expect? God wants to confirm our faith and he tells us exactly how he's going to do it. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Whom did you learn the faith from? Dad and mom? Did they bring you to baptism? Did they take you to church even when you really didn't want to go? Did they read the Bible to you? And what about your teachers? Lutheran school, Sunday school, your pastors, it was their job to teach you God's word too. But didn't they also love it and cherish it just like they wanted you to? In point of fact, many of you were taught God's word before you ever even set foot in Sunday school. From infancy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Greek word for infancy includes children in the womb. How many of you heard God's word from the womb? I know that pregnant women are not supposed to smoke or drink or eat sushi, but one thing pregnant women absolutely should do is hear the word of God. Because baby hears what mom hears, and faith comes from hearing, and God gives us his word to hear even from infancy. Plus, the Greek word for scripture refers not just to the Bible as a whole, but to the individual letters of the words. We hang on every letter of the word of God, no matter what age we are. Because every letter is inspired by God. All scripture is God-breathed. In catechism class, whether you took it as a younger person or an older person, you learned all about verbal inspiration. How God gave the exact individual letters of the exact individual words that he wanted written down. This is not the word of men. This is the word of God. And learning that word is a lifelong endeavor. Timothy, the person to whom this letter is written, was a grown man, a pastor, someone who knew scripture from infancy. And what does Paul tell him? Good job, dude. You are all done now, guy. Relax. Take it easy, bro. You never need to read scripture again. No way. Paul says, continue in what you have learned. So what about you? Have you kept up reading the Bible? Will you keep up reading the Bible? When will you spend time with Jesus tomorrow? Or next week? What about next month? Or next year? 
What's your plan to continue in what you have learned? I pray that either you were or you will be smarter than I was. I waited until I was 25 to read scripture cover to cover. And I've read it the whole way through every year since then. And when I know it all, I'll let you know. I'll send you an email. Almost 15 times the whole way through, and I do not know it all. I have barely even scratched the surface. Continue in what you have learned. Because all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Christ confirms us, makes us strong by his word at every age. And Confirmation Sunday is a good Sunday to remember that because it's a time of transition. You were probably first connected to the word through somebody else. Mom and dad took you to church, and because you were with your parents, you were with the word. Or you fell in love with a woman who loved the word, and because you loved her, you grew to love the things that she loved. Or maybe you were connected to a pastor or a school like ours where you heard the word. But eventually, that connection is lost. Parents die. Kids move out. Relationships break. Pastors leave. Catechism class ends. You transition. And the devil is ready. He has been waiting for this moment. He knows exactly what to say. He knows exactly how to disconnect you from the word. Because no time in the word and a lot of time in the world unconfirms you. You start to believe things that just aren't true. You know, God wants you to be happy. And you are not happy in this marriage. But didn't God say, love your spouse? You know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But didn't God command us to meet together? Well, you know, church is really boring. Yeah, but didn't God warn us that our sinful nature hates his word? You know, God wouldn't have made you that way if it were sin. But don't we all enter this world with a sinful nature that corrupts his creation? God wants you to be in his word so that you're not weak. Remember, all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is how he does it. Christ confirms us by teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Teaching is imparting knowledge because first, you got to have the facts. But you don't learn the facts of Scripture just for the sake of knowing them. No, these facts are the living Word of God. They rebuke you. They show you your sin. They make you sorry for your sin. They make you hate your sin. It is just like God says. Is not my word like fire, like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? God breaks your sinful nature into pieces with his word to correct you. He corrected your sin by nailing it to a cross. He corrects you by his word because that is the only place where you learn that you are forgiven. Consider this correction. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. There is no record of sins, of straying, of teenage years wasted, of, dedic of decades dedicated to anything other than the glory of God. Because with God, there is forgiveness. 
Because Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose, and now Jesus lives to train you in righteousness by showing you what's right. Training takes time. Training takes a lot of time. You ever trained for a marathon or a recital? That kind of training can consume your entire life. And God never tires of training us in what is right. He leads us back to his word. He put it down in black and white so that we can be trained to do what is right. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that phrase, that phrase is awesome. The man of God is someone who belongs to God, someone confirmed by God, someone who continues in what he learned or what she learned for the rest of his life or the rest of her life. So, have you ever noticed how confirmation is kind of sort of like a wedding. Weddings have white dresses. Confirmation has white robes. Weddings require months of preparation. Confirmation requires years of preparation reading the Bible. At your wedding, you make a lifelong promise. I promise to be faithful to you until death parts us. At confirmation, you make a lifelong promise. Jesus, I promise to be faithful to you. I promise to be faithful to your word. I promise to be faithful to my church because I am convinced that here, your word is taught correctly and I will continue in that word and I will endure all things, even death, rather than reject any single letter of that word. Wow. But there's another way that confirmation is like a wedding. How many married people keep their promises? About 50% of marriages end in divorce. How many confirmations end in divorce with promises broken and scattered to the wind? What do you think you deserve if you stand before God and make a lifelong promise to him and then break it. Death? Hell? Sin does not leave you when you're confirmed. And temptations only become more complex the older you become. You cannot defeat them on your own. You need Jesus to confirm you. And he does. Jesus gives you his word to make you strong. Jesus gives you his word to make you wise for salvation. Remember that. He saved you from death. He saved you from hell. Jesus lived for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus rose for me is not some cute phrase that Pastor Hedrick repeats all the time. No, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the only things that really matter. You learned it. You learned it. Now, continue in it. Jesus lived for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus rose for me is the one thing that you need to remember above every other thing because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith together with the Christians who went before us 
and the Christians who will come after us, including William, who will speak the Apostles' Creed in just a few minutes by himself. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing for the prayer of the church. Jesus Christ, Lord of life and King of glory, you are our God. We trust in you, and you have saved us. You are the Lord. We rejoice and are glad in your salvation. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Since you have swallowed up death with your victory, fill us with confidence that everything we face, we face with our triumphant Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Bless missionaries, evangelists, and Christians everywhere who share your invitation in the good news of your resurrection. Bring your message of new life to hearts dead in sin. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Lord, grant that we may be faithful witnesses of your resurrection, not only by word of mouth, but in actions and truth, for your honor and glory. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Lift up those who are bowed down, their faces downcast with grief from loss. Drive out doubt with the good news of your resurrection and restore faith that one day we will rise imperishable and stand before you in glory. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and truly human, you do not change, and you are holy in all your works. Remove all our unbelief and doubt and fill our hearts with the gifts of your grace that we may believe and know you as our Lord and God. You live and reign now and forever. Amen. And hear us, O Father, for the sake of him who is the firstborn of the dead and is now alive forever, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Not you, William. You can come up here. And stand right here. Hi. Are you all right? Good to go? All right. Brother in Christ, my student, my friend. Our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to our Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his own dear child. You now have the privilege 
of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And you are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Are you ready? Okay. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge that in baptism, God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Now this, I'll say it with you as well. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of word and sacrament, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as long as you live? I do, and I ask that question. Now, since it is God alone who enables in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for this confirmant, that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in him. Let us, therefore, bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, in baptism, you made this brother a member of the body of your dear son, Jesus Christ. You washed him by his blood, buried him with him in his death, and gave him a new life in his resurrection. Renew him by the Holy Spirit, which you have poured out on him generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let him live out his life as an heir of eternal life. Lead him to serve your church in holiness and righteousness all his days. Keep him in fellowship with all who wait for the return of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. William, please kneel. William Anders Gregerson, you have chosen as your confirmation verse one of the outstanding passages of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus promised in Hebrews 13, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. William, your church now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church and receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you.
God's service continues with our next hymn, Thy Strong Word. We'll sing the first three stanzas. It's printed on page 15 in your service folder. Please stand for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now may the glorious Father, who by his power raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, give you the spirit of wisdom to know the hope to which he has called you. And may he preserve you in body, soul, and spirit until our own resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. We'll sing stanzas four and five of thy strong word.
Hi. I don't have the announcements, but I do have the microphones. <laughs> we didn't really talk this through. But what I will say is that this morning, you're getting a stew of the proffers, right? It's the second Sunday after Easter, but we stuck a confirmation text in there. But the cherry on top that pulled it all together was the last hymn we sang, Thy Strong Word. And William and I, William picked the hymn. But we never talked about this, but it's my favorite hymn too. So it's written by Martin Franzman, one of the Wisconsin Synod's greatest thinkers, so great that the Missouri Synod stole him and then <laughs> kept him before, during, and after the split. Um, just amazing how it brought together the themes of the second Sunday of Easter and Confirmation. I'm just taking up time now because I'm so excited to see all of you. And I didn't get to talk a whole lot after the last service. But there are like a bunch of announcements, so I should probably give Odell a microphone. Or no, you, you're wearing one. Okay. Do you want the one that goes to the camera? No. Good morning. A couple of things that I had as well. Uh, one is to say thank you to Pastor Hedrick for being here and coming back to encourage us with the gospel and God's richest blessings to William in the future. May God keep you strong by his word and in his word. Uh, it's nice that that's a recorded sermon. Go back and watch it. Go back and watch it maybe each year on your confirmation and remember what, what God wants you to remember. Um, I have uh, something that only I can do because I'm the only one who has the letter, so this is why I also get, get to give announcements. Uh, this morning, right before the first service, actually, I checked my email, which I never really do, but I did today. And I'm because you never should do. <laughs> it's almost always good news. <laughs> it's good news today. It's good news. Dear members of Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church, writes Emma Doble, on April 5th, I received the divine call to serve your congregation as preschool teacher. After much prayerful consideration, I write this letter to announce my formal acceptance of this call and express my joy that this privilege has been granted to me. I look forward to serving the Lord through Christ. Please continue to keep my family in your prayers as we prepare to move from Nebraska to Wisconsin. And she closes her letter by saying, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Christ, Emma Dole. So, praise God for that. And... If you have any place for her to live, <laughs> they would also appreciate knowing that because they are still looking and the market is tight. So if you hear of anything that's going to go on on the market before it gets on the market, either to rent or buy, it doesn't have to be a certain amount of bedrooms right now. It just has to be warm and dry in the winter. They'll take that. All right. I also wanted to remind you that we have a voters meeting to extend a semi-retirement call to Pastor Weber. Uh, set for this coming week at 4.30 p.m. So we would uh, be staffed then with one and, in a sense, a half pastors. Pastor Weber would help with preaching, and he would also visit our shut-ins and make hospital calls, and also kind of do some things uh, with our elderly members that he's pretty excited about that I think would be really great for our church. Um, and then uh, the last thing I wanted to let you know about, and uh, the ushers can go ahead and start handing those out as I explain this. We have a, a stewardship survey for you this 